tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Bizarre clues to a murder are left for the police. A woman's skull and an anonymous note. Was young Linda Sherman killed by her husband? Hey! Or did her tragic fate lie in someone else's hands? From the moment John Fuget began dating Erica Richardson, it seemed like they were destined to be together. But Erica soon found out that Fuget was a ticking time bomb, and the fuse was burning. Donna Tyson claims her digital clock suddenly began to blink the exact time of her son's fatal car crash. Sharon Troop believes her deceased daughter appears to her in ghostly visions. Is it possible these mothers are receiving messages from their dead children? It seemed that she had the perfect life, but in truth, Donna Morrow was suffering silently in a troubled marriage. Six days before Christmas, Donna mysteriously disappeared, leaving behind four children. Did she voluntarily walk away, escaping her unhappy life? Or was Donna Morrow a victim of foul play? Join me for this fascinating edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Bridgeton, Missouri, the Casa Gallardo restaurant. So you can go to set over there. Look, right over Two there. Two women having lunch notice something strange outside the window. Is there a... Sir? A shocking piece of evidence that would turn an unsolved missing person case into a murder mystery. There in the bushes was a human skull. It's a very well manicured area, plants and, and gravel and what have you. And the way it was situated, it would give one the impression that you know somebody had put it there so you would see it. The skull was determined to be that of an adult female. Thorough examination revealed little else. Well, during that time period, there was the relocating of a cemetery that was uh, in the area, and uh, a lot of bodies were being exhumed, graves were being moved. So it gives you the impression now that this may be a prank and uh, there'd be no reason to suspect that there were any foul play. The skull was cataloged, stored in the evidence room at the Bridgeton County Morgue, and forgotten. One year later, 25 miles away at the Vanita Park Police Station, a mysterious letter arrived. It stated that the Bridgeton Police had L. Sherman's skull. Uh, give me the Bridgeton uh, Police Department. Dental records confirmed that the anonymous skull was the remains of Linda Sherman, a 26-year-old wife and mother who was last seen April 22, 1985. Her disappearance is clouded with intrigue, involving an allegedly jealous husband and an unknown lover. Years later, troubling questions still remain. Who killed Linda Sherman? Why was her skull left outside a local restaurant? And where is the rest of her body? At 16, Linda Sherman was a typical teenager. She grew up in the St. Louis suburb of Vanita Park, the youngest of four. With siblings more than 10 years older, she was sheltered, quiet, and reserved. Linda was kind of a shy girl, I guess, growing up. She wanted to be more outgoing and more uh, athletic, I think, but uh, she was more at home type of a girl, I guess. Linda was a junior when she fell for her high school sweetheart, 17-year-old Don Sherman, and got married. Hi, Mama. Hi. Hi. When their daughter Patty was born, the young mother was determined to finish school. Linda's mom would watch the baby while she completed her senior year. Dad, get out of here. 
out here. To support his new family, Don took a job at a local gas station. It was hard, but it was rewarding. We were very happy together. The relationship was rocky later on in our marriage several times, but not, not in the early years. I'm gonna put this plant in here. Working opposite shifts and money trouble strained their relationship. In their nine-year marriage, Linda had taken Patty and moved out several times, but the couple always reconciled. When we be home? I'll call you later. Hello. Come on, Don. According to Linda's older brother, Dennis, Don was obsessed with knowing Linda's every move. Tonight, Don, all right? No, she's not here. Don was very possessive over her. She said, when I get off of work, if I'm not home within five minutes, he wants to know what's going on, who are you seeing, what are you doing out that late? He was always, he was always hitting her, and things just weren't right. I go to work every day, and I come home. I don't run around on you. Linda told her family that she feared Don's violent temper once she even got a restraining order to keep him at a distance. Some family members claim by April of 1985 she had had enough. Linda was making final plans to take Patty and leave. She'd already made the decision to move out. She had filed for divorce, and uh, she had definitely made plans to start a new life. We can't do this anymore. We're leaving. I can't handle She was going to do it this time, and she really meant that, meant that she was going to leave Don for good. On April 22nd, Linda left her night job at 2.16 in the morning. What are you doing? It's three, 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Where you been? 3 o'clock in the morning. I've been working. She been... didn't come home from work until uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning. You make me sick. You we got into an argument about the fact that she wouldn't tell me where she'd been. And uh, we stayed up until at least 4 o'clock in the morning uh, discussing that. Linda was still on the sofa later that morning when Patty left for school. She always took me to school, but my dad took me to school that day, and I remember her laying on the couch with her face to the back of the couch, and she didn't get up. She didn't get up to kiss me goodbye. She didn't say anything to me. She was just laying there. That would be the last time Patty saw her mother. Don claims that when he returned to the house that afternoon, Linda was on edge. When I, I came back home, Linda was still there. She should have been at work by go. then. I'm late. Well, hold on, I just got I home. Just said, I'm late. I've got to go. She was mad because she was running late. Don says Linda drove off at about 6 p.m., but there are no witnesses that saw her leave. Linda never arrived at work and never came home. When she didn't come back, I assumed it was typical of the, the previous times that she had left, and I thought that she took off with somebody. Although Linda's family suspected she was having an affair, they had reason to believe something terrible had happened to her. We knew that if she left, there was no way she's leaving without the daughter, and the daughter was still at home. And so there was definitely foul play. I was coming. Home from a meeting and, uh... According to the Millers, at their insistence, Don went to the Vanita Park Police Station and filed a missing and, persons um, report. Uh, that, that's, that's the last time I, I seen her. That was Monday. Meanwhile, Sam and Fran frantically searched for Linda. On a hunch, they headed to the local airport. As we pulled into the short-term parking, why, there's Linda's car sitting right there. Is that her car? I know my sister's car. Yeah, I know. And we could see inside the car, it's and we locked. could see her school books and her hat and everything. So we contacted the uh, airport police, and it's they locked. come, and the car was locked, but they tried the trunk, and the trunk was open. And when they opened the trunk, I hate to say it, but we fully expected Linda to be in there, and she wasn't. Could it be possible that Linda had abandoned her daughter and run off with another man? Don claims he saw Linda with another man 
days after her disappearance. She drove past him in a van and quickly ducked out of sight. Hey! Five years later, when Linda's skull appeared, suspicion fell on Don. In a bizarre coincidence, her skull was found outside the Casa Gallardo restaurant. The woman was sitting there eating, and she looked down and saw a skull looking right at her. One of Don's favorite hangouts. A human skull? Yeah, yeah. And the cops came in, and they took I was pictures. at the restaurant that evening after the skull had been found. I had heard about it that day when it happened, but never had any connection to it until uh, later on. No one connected right, okay, it until a year later when the anonymous letter arrived at the Bonita Park Police Station. I was rather astounded. It was obvious to me that someone wanted us to know that we had obviously missed something and was trying to tell us that Linda remains had been recovered. It was scary. You know, somebody that put those remains there at the restaurant obviously knew me or you know, knew that I hung out there. I mean, it wasn't, it, we're not talking about a place that I casually visited, we're talking about a place that I would visit two or three times a week. Did Don have reason to be frightened? Or did he have a secret motivation for placing the skull there himself? Some speculate Don was making plans to remarry and needed proof Linda was dead. For Don, the skull provided the perfect evidence of Linda's demise. But for Patty, the find was devastating. When the skull was found, I just kind of lost all hope in life. I didn't know that she was dead. I guess there was always some hope that she had just left. 16 years after the murder, Lieutenant Webb still hopes to find Linda's killer. The only suspect that I've been unable to eliminate is Don Sherman. At this point in time, he has never been ruled out as a suspect. In my heart, I, I think that he might have done it. You know, I, I can't think of anybody else who would have. I had nothing to do with Linda Sherman's disappearance, nor her death. I still think that she left with someone and obviously met with foul play and uh, died. I would really like to find the rest of her wherever it's at so that we can have a proper burial for her. She can rest in peace. And um, I'd like to know what happened to her and who did it and they should serve the agony that we have for 15 years. Linda Sherman, a young mother's life tragically taken and shrouded with uncertainty. Today, police hope new technology and soil sampling will someday lead them to Linda's body and eventually her killer. In a quiet neighborhood in Tampa, Florida, Erica Richardson was excited and a bit apprehensive about her first date with John Fuget. Oh, thank you. Erica was shy and dated infrequently, while Fuget had a reputation as a ladies' man. But they hit it off right away. And as a relationship developed, they seemed more and more like the perfect fit. Erica's family found Fuget likable and charming. When I first saw them together, they looked nice, and I thought that, you know, they would make a good, a nice couple. A couple that soon became inseparable. Erica was literally swept off her feet by Fuget, who held down a steady job as an electrical technician. Erica was convinced John Fuget was Mr. Wright. Apparently, she was wrong, dead wrong. Family and friends first became concerned when Erica invited Fouget to move in with her. The decision seemed out of character. Erica was a smart, successful woman who held a degree in microbiology, managed a large pharmacy, and valued her independence. 
However, despite a good job, great friends, and a close-knit family, Erica was missing a special man in her life, a boy she hoped Jean Fouget would fill. Okay, honey. Mm -hmm. I am off to the mall, and I will be back in about a couple of hours. The mall? Okay? Yeah, With we'll who? to the mall. The trouble started not long after Fuget moved into the comfortable home Erica had recently purchased. Look, don't be I could see that he was wearing a mask. I discovered him to be a jealous, mean, controlling person. He was just too possessive. He wanted Erica all to himself. Don't be so paranoid and jealous. I am not being jealous, yes, but I want to know are. where you're going with. Not only was he possessive, he wanted to isolate her not only from her family, but from friends, too. Over the next several months, the relationship continued to unravel. According to police, Fuget was on a downward spiral. A friend and lover turned abuser and stalker. Pharmacy. What took you so long to get to the phone, girl? John, you cannot continue to call me here at work like this. We talked about this. He exhibited wild mood swings and repeatedly called Erica at the pharmacy, accusing her of being unfaithful and making unreasonable demands. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Fuget moved out of the house, but his erratic behavior persisted. Who was that? Reportedly, he began showing up at Erica's workplace unannounced, harassing her and threatening physical harm. What are you doing here? Don't try to get smart with me. Answer my question, girl. Answer Erica question. was really afraid of John because of the threats, what he said he would do to her. Erica was forced to file a restraining order. Still, Fuget would show up at the house at all hours. Finally, with the help of her father, she found the courage to call the police and have him arrested. We don't need trouble. Let's go. Undeterred by the threat of jail time, Fuget continued to pursue Watch Erica. Watch your head. So I'm just gonna go home tonight. A few weeks before Christmas, she met her mother at a local mall to do some shopping. They bought some gifts and a comforter. It was too big for us to carry, so they said that we could pick it up in the back. When we came to the car, we heard somebody say, hey there. Hey, babe, come here. Don't worry, Ma, I can handle it, okay? What is it? I miss you. You miss me, and? I just want to talk, that's all. Erica's mother heard little of the conversation, but she says she wasn't surprised when her daughter agreed to Fuget's request to meet. I don't know. Well, John was a type person that he could sweet talk a lady, and he made promises that, you know, things were going to get better, he was going to do better. And, of course, she took him at his word. Puget's behavior followed an all-too-familiar pattern. And the sight of him following Erica out of the parking lot was alarming to her mother. Still, Imogene Richardson believed there was little she could do. Sunday came and went. Imogene heard nothing from her daughter. I didn't hardly sleep that night thinking about it. Monday morning, I called Erica's house and I didn't get an answer. So I called her job. The conversation was short and chilling. Erica had not shown up at the pharmacy, nor had she called in. Frightened, Imogene went over to her daughter's home. John's pickup truck was in the driveway. I went to the door, and that's when I looked in the window. And nothing seemed to have been disturbed. I started to my car, and something told me to go back. Erica! And I went back, and I looked through another window, and that's when I saw a knife and blood.
and I knew then something had happened to my daughter. Minutes later, police confirmed Imogene's worst fears. Erica had been stabbed repeatedly in the upper body. The shock and grief was overwhelming. Erica was my daughter, my friend. She was successful. She was bright. She was caring, loving. She was just a daughter that any mother would love to have. When I lost Erica, I lost part of me. While Erica's parents tried to make sense of a senseless act, police cordoned off the crime scene. Inside, detectives and members of the CSI unit went to work. There were some articles that were strewn about the home, uh, which were indicative of a, of a struggle. Uh, there were no items of value that were uh, appeared to us at that point in time missing from the home, uh, indicating to us that someone maybe she knew might have been in the home. We found, of course, Erica Richardson's blood, but we also found the blood of a second party mixed in with her blood. Detectives suspected the blood of the second party belonged to John Fuget, but they couldn't prove it without a sample of his DNA. Fuget's fingerprints are all over the crime scene, but that didn't implicate him either since he had lived in the same house. However, there was one solid lead to pursue. An eyewitness report is seeing Fuget driving Erica's 1992 Honda a short time after she had died. We issued the uh, warrant for his arrest based on those facts. The vehicle was ultimately located on December 23rd in Lafayette, Louisiana, where uh, Mr. Fuget is from. That's where he has a lot of family and friends. Detectives questioned Fuget's relatives who claimed they hadn't seen him in several weeks. Today, John Fuget is still on the lam. He is wanted for grand theft auto and unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Fuget remains the number one suspect in the murder of Erica Richardson. The only way we feel John Fuget would be able to stay hidden for this amount of time would be to uh, disappear to a new location, not tell anyone of his whereabouts, and start a new identity or a new life from there. Due to the fact that John Puget is a, a mechanic or mechanically inclined, that he very well may be employed on an oil rig or something of that nature off the coast of Louisiana or Texas. Meanwhile, a loving family continues to mourn the loss of their only daughter while maintaining hope that justice will be served before it's too late. There is some young lady, I'm sure, that he's involved with at this time who doesn't know what he has done. And I just pray that it doesn't happen again. And I wish that someone would come forward and help us get him brought to justice. Loss of a loved one is a traumatic experience, especially in the case of a parent losing a child. Donna Tyson and Sharon Troop are two mothers who believe they have received messages from their deceased children. Can those who have passed away communicate from beyond the grave? Or should the events you're about to see be considered pure coincidence? Mothers are supposed to protect their children. And this continues even when they're adults. And it's worse then because you have no control over them when you, as you do when they're small. At 34, Michael Owen was a recovering alcoholic. His mother, Donna, and family were grateful that he was attending AA meetings and holding down a steady job as a boat mechanic. But in late January, Michael gave in to temptation. Michael had partied the night before with some friends. 
He was two blocks from his home, going approximately 65 miles an hour, when he hit a parked recycling truck. He basically died instantly. It's like a part of you's gone, and it's like there's a big hole in your heart. It was just two months later, in a gift shop, that Donna believes she felt an emotional connection to Michael. In the middle was a huge rack of the little porcelain cups that have your names on them from A to Z. Setting off to one side were two cups, and one said, I love you, Mom, and the other one said, Michael. And I felt like Michael was there with me, and he was telling me it was OK. Weeks later, while in the market, another unusual incident occurred. Donna was surprised when she happened upon an out-of-place book that seemed destined for her. And I thought, this is strange, this book. Why is it sitting here? And there was no writing on the cover. And I opened it up. What Donna found was a message she feels was meant specifically for her. I am the ancient mariner who had a tale in his heart to be told to all. To someone, I am always saying, someday you must meet my mother. It mentioned the ancient mariner, and Michael was a boat mechanic. And he often used to refer to himself as the ancient mariner. I started crying when I read it. And I said, I have to have this book. Michael's sending this to me. Donna says the most convincing communications involve both the time of Michael's accident, 620, and his time of death, 633. While working at her home office, Donna claims something happened to the digital clock. Michael's clock was flashing, 620, and it was not 620. I know you're here. You don't have to do that. That was the time of the accident. And all the other digital clocks in the house were fine. He was just letting me know that he was there. What happened next was very unsettling. 14 months after his death, Donna says she heard Michael's voice on her answering machine. The message was supposedly recorded at 6.33. The operator voice that is on your voicemail said, Saturday, 6.33, which is the time that Michael died. And I heard Michael's voice. He only says two words. He says, follow me. Saturday, 6.33 PM. Follow me. End of message. And I was dumbfounded. I had his friends come over and listen to it. His sisters listened to it. And it is Michael's voice. Donna is convinced the messages from Michael are designed to bring her comfort. But others have a different explanation for encounters like these. There's no greater loss than the loss of a child. And that is exactly what the explanation is, is that emotionally um, driven people in a state of grief um, tend to see things in their environment that connect them to their lost loved ones. Donna's experience resonates with thousands of other parents who believe their deceased children are in contact with them. Sharon Troop believes her daughter, Wendy, has appeared to her several times. Wendy was a freshman in college when she became a victim of a date rape. Shortly thereafter, Wendy became depressed and tragically committed suicide. Wendy was only 19 years old. Sharon, Wendy's mother, was devastated and spent the days after her daughter's death in an emotional fog. I was sitting there and I had been sobbing off and on. I was just a mess. And I leaned my head back and I saw, it's like a movie picture came on. It was then that Sharon claims Wendy came to her in a vision. I was looking down a hallway and it was very bright. And she looked at me as if to say, I am so sorry. I made the hugest mistake, and I can't take it back. And she turned around, and she walked through the door, 
and that was it. It was gone. And I just bawled because I wanted her back. And she was gone. Sharon's second sighting came a few months later when Owen, a friend of Wendy's, rented a movie to try and bolster Sharon and her husband Bill's spirits. Something caught my eye. I looked over by the door, and Wendy was standing there. She was dressed in a real comfortable girl-type flannel shirt, and she smiled at me, and she looked over at Owen, and then she was gone. This time I didn't cry. This time I was like, wow, I know I saw her. I mean, I wasn't even thinking about her in that instant, and she's there. So I honestly felt that she was letting me know that she was so pleased that Owen was spending time with us and we were together so that we could help one another. It was Christmas, a year later, when Sharon received what she calls undeniable confirmation of Wendy's continued presence in her life. You're doing okay. I just really miss her. I know, sweetie. We all do. We all miss her so much. At a holiday party across the street from their home, Sharon and Bill were visiting with friends they hadn't seen in over a year when Sharon became upset and went home. Sure? I'm fine. I'm sure? fine. I wasn't home about 10 minutes, and Bill called me from across the street, and he said, I have something to tell you, and it's really important, and I want you to stay up. When Bill returned home, he told Sharon that Pam, a friend of their neighbors, claimed to have had an unusual experience involving Wendy just weeks after she died. She saw Wendy. She just saw her face. And there weren't any words, but she was absolutely positive that it was Wendy. And the way she described it was exactly the same way that you've told me. It was probably about a month after Wendy had died. I went to bed, I think, before everyone else that night. I saw a girl, and it was kind of just a headshot. It just kind of zoomed in on me. And I felt this tremendous energy. It kind of like if you've ever been shocked by electrical fence, you know, the little warm surge of current that you feel through your body. But I could just sense that she wanted to tell her parents that she was OK now. And she was finally at peace. And it happened that quickly, and then it was gone. It seemed obvious to me, you know, who it was and, and what the purpose of that visit was. She saw her. I think it was a gift from God. So to let her come back for us to see, because somebody could tell you that, you wouldn't believe them. Seeing something is totally different. The real question here, I think, that touches us deeply is, is there actually an afterlife that people who die go to and that they're actually not gone. And if we're going to look at this question objectively and scientifically and not emotionally, then we have to answer, nobody knows. Sharon and Donna will continue to find solace in the messages they believe are left for them by their children. I believe that there is something more out there. They don't just go away. Some people say to me, do you believe in the afterlife? Do you believe that there's something beyond? Yes, I do. If you choose not to believe that, that is your privilege. Me, I'm going to believe it. With only five days left to Christmas, 37-year-old Donna Morrow had just finished her last-minute shopping. She looked forward to spending the holidays with her four young children. Where you been? Honey, I've been Christmas shopping. I've been Thank waiting you. for you for a long time. It's but her relationship with her husband, Joe, was rapidly disintegrating. We interviewed several of Donna's friends who asked not to be identified by name. She had told me that Joe was very controlling, and she didn't indicate to me that he was um, physically abusive, but I, I got the impression that she was afraid of him. Listen, I want to get in here. We're going to talk right now. It had not always been this way. When Donna first met Joe, he seemed the ideal partner, charming, wealthy, and kind. Donna's family, however, had a different impression. 
He was arrogant. He thought he was better than everybody else. And he was condescending. He was just basically a jerk with money. Within months of meeting, the couple married and began the large family both had always wanted. They moved into a luxurious home in upscale Menlo Park, California, and Donna settled in to be a full-time mom. For 13 years, Donna appeared happy with her life. Then one Thanksgiving, Donna revealed the truth about her seemingly perfect marriage. Thank you. I'm not that good, Mom. I don't, I don't want to talk about me. Anymore. Why? What's the matter? I... She told me that she did not love Joe Mom, anymore, I'm that she wanted a divorce. A divorce. I just... And she said, but Mom, until after the holidays, I won't do anything because I don't want to ruin Christmas for the children. Do you want a cookie? That Christmas, Donna's mother and her relatives gathered in White Plains, Missouri to celebrate. Donna could not make it, so her stepfather called California to wish her a happy holiday. Hello? Hey, Joe, Merry Christmas. Hey, Frank, Merry Christmas to you, too. Hey, I want to talk to Donna. She's not here right now. Well, where is she? Well, you know, I don't know. Uh, we had an argument on the 19th, and... She walked out, and uh, I haven't heard from her since. Joe didn't bother to give us any kind of a story, just that she was gone. What's happening? I don't know. He says she's not there. It's like the whole atmosphere over Christmas just died right there. It was terrible because we were so far away, and there was nothing that we could do. Joe Morrow maintains that his wife Donna voluntarily left him and their children to start life anew. But Donna's friends and family are convinced that she fell victim to foul play. There's no compelling physical evidence to support either conclusion. No body has ever been found. There's also no sign that Donna Morrow is still alive. Without your help, Donna's fate may never be known. What happened the night your wife disappeared? In an interview with Menlo Park Police shortly after Donna's disappearance, Joe Morrow stated that he last saw his wife on December 19th at approximately 10 p.m. Well, we had somewhat of a heated argument, and um, she got very upset. And Following an argument, door, Donna stormed out the front door, taking her purse and keys. Did she take her car? No. She didn't take her car? We asked him if he had any explanation as to why she had not taken the car. He didn't have an explanation other than that she is known to go out for walks from time to time. I thought that she was seeing another man. Morrow also suggests that his wife was having an affair. Further police investigation established that Donna had indeed formed a close friendship with another man. I think he was kind and understanding and was giving her um, a shoulder to cry on, so to speak. But due to her marital status, it was not going beyond that, other than seeking friendship. Hey, it's me. Police okay. discovered that Donna called this man on the night she disappeared at 7.30 p.m. So we knew that she was alive and well at that point. Donna had wanted to get together with him, uh, and he declined the invitation Donna's friend provided authorities with an alibi and passed a lie detector test. He has been ruled out as a suspect. Police then found a witness who could tell them what happened next. Donna and Joe's own eight-year-old daughter. She told detectives that at 9.30 p.m. she awoke to her parents screaming at each other. According to the daughter, the yelling got quieter and quieter and then stopped altogether. And shortly thereafter, she ended up hearing one set of footsteps leading to the front door area. She didn't see whether it was her father or her mom who was walking to the front doorstep. She just heard him. Was this the sound of Donna Morrow leaving the house just as Joe Morrow claimed? Donna's daughter seemed to confirm that scenario with what she next told investigators. A few hours later, she went into her parents' bedroom. Only Joe Mora was there, asleep. Did Donna Morrow, trapped in an allegedly abusive marriage, simply walk out the front door to start a new life? Donna would never just walk out. She lived for her children. She would never just 
go and leave him with the man that she planned to leave in a couple of weeks. But there was no compelling evidence to contradict Donna leaving voluntarily. Then police discovered the first potential clue. On the side of a bucket, a small splatter of blood. Hey, Simpson, you want to come take a look at this? We don't have Donna's blood to compare it to, but we were able to exclude the children and Joe as being the uh, donors of that blood. The fact that Donna is not here, the question remains, could it be Donna's? But without a body, a crime scene, or any compelling forensic evidence, the police investigation ground to a halt. Okay. Housekeeping. Hello. Three weeks later, in a motel room 95 miles from the Moros' home. Hello. Sir? Are you okay? Joe Mora was sprawled on the bed, semi-conscious. He had taken an overdose of barbiturates. You okay? The other thing that was odd was that they found a large number of suicide notes to various people, none addressed to his allegedly missing wife, and she was not mentioned in any of those letters. Uh, yes, I'm a maid in the hotel. Um, Joe Mora recovered from the suicide attempt and continued to deny any involvement in Donna's disappearance. But two years later, Mora was sued in civil court for wrongful death by Donna's parents on behalf of her children. At the same time, Mora pled guilty to an unrelated fraud charge and was scheduled to surrender on June 24th. He never showed up. I think that Joe Mora was shrewd enough that he knew if he could stagger around us for as long as he did, that he could build an exit strategy, and that's what he did. After Joe's disappearance, his estate settled the wrongful death suit and agreed to pay $2 million. Guardianship of his four children was given to his brother and sister-in-law. Ultimately, an arrest warrant citing probable cause was issued for Joseph Morrow for the murder of his wife. Family, friends, and the police are now convinced that he killed her. My impression is that perhaps Joe found out about this other person, this young man, and in a fit of rage just threw Donna down or she hit her head or something. I just feel like it was a crime of passion. I think that she probably left the residence dead and was dragged to the garage where she was placed in a vehicle. The location of where the blood was found on the bucket speaks for itself that it was probably during a cleanup process in the garage. I would like to see Joe put behind bars or put to death. It wouldn't bother me. And I want my daughter found. I want to at least know what he did with her so I can put her to rest. next time for four more intriguing stories cases where you may have that one vital clue that can help solve the mystery